Hello, welcome to another video of General Chemistry 1. My name is Daniel and today we're going to be talking about the energy of chemical systems. So in any kind of chemical compound there's energy stored in bonds and a reaction just involves the breaking and formation of bonds and that also involves a transfer, a release or absorption of energy. So we're going to start off by defining exactly what energy is. We're going to go and look at how energy is transferred between a system and its surroundings. We're going to look at state and path functions, how um, the current state versus the path taken to a thermodynamic state influences the quantitative values of each thermodynamic state. And we're going to also look at enthalpy, exothermic, endothermic reactions, and we're going to look at something called Hess's law. So like I said, the first thing we're going to look at is we're going to define energy. Energy is simply the capacity of a system to do heat or work, which are the two ways that one can transfer energy between systems. There's two main types. There's potential energy, which is due to, due to an object's position or its composition. So for example, if I hold up this mouse here and I dropped it, when I'm holding it up here and drop it, it has potential energy. And that's what causes it to fall because of the force of gravity. Or composition just meaning any of the energy stored in a chemical bond. Now the other type of energy is kinetic energy and that's due to an object's um, motion. It's given by the formula Ke equals one half mv squared. So kinetic energy depends on the mass of what's moving as well as its velocity. And that would just be if I took the mouse and threw it. I would be giving a kinetic energy of motion. Okay? So Here's a diagram that we can look at to demonstrate that point as well. So we have a ball up here first off. It drops down to the floor. It has potential energy. It converts to kinetic energy as it falls. So once it hits the ground, or once it's about to hit the ground right here, it has its maximum kinetic energy. After it bounces up, it's going to be slowly losing kinetic energy as it slows on its bounce, eventually going to a point where it maximizes its potential energy once again. And this will eventually stop due to friction forces and other things from physics. Now, there's two ways to transfer energy. There's heat, which is caused by differences in temperature gradients. So for example, if we put an ice cube in water, the transfer of heat is going to occur because the water is warmer than the ice and temperature wants to maintain thermodynamic equilibrium, meaning the same temperature throughout a system. And hence what's going to happen is that heat will be transferred from the water into the ice. The same would happen if, let's say, you put um, a warm object into water. Let's say you heat up a metal pellet and put it into water. That would heat up the water because of the same thing, thermodynamic equilibrium. Now one important thing to note is that heat isn't a substance. It's not a molecule, it's not an atom, it's not even a physical thing. And that's kind of a hard concept to get your mind around, but just remember that heat is energy due to transfer of temper. sorry, Heat is just caused from temperature gradients. Differences in kinetic energy between two systems cause heat transfer, and that will eventually equilibrate the kinetic energy of each system. Okay. Now the other kind of transfer we can do is work. Work is just the force acting over a distance. So in a physics example, if I pushed a ball down a road, that would be tr me myself doing work on the ball to cause it to move. A system we'll be looking at in a few slides is a piston, like you have in your car engine. So if you take a piston over a container and compress it, you're compressing the gas inside the container, and hence that also means you're doing work on the system. You're adding energy into the system by compressing it. So those are the two major kinds of heat transfers of energy. And now we're going to look at, we've been looking at a lot of physics-esque examples, you know, pushing a ball down a hill. So what do we mean when we talk about energy in a chemical system? We're obviously not going to, you know, throw a reagent bottle to give it kinetic energy. That's not what we're talking about here. Instead, what we're talking about is the kinetic energy of individual molecules, how quickly they're moving 
As you remember, that's based on their mass and their velocity squared. So chemical energy is that which is released or absorbed from the formation and breaking of bonds in the reactant and products. And there's two scenarios we can have. In an exothermic process, what happens is we have our reagents, we create products, and this reaction releases heat. So you could say that heat is a product of an exothermic reaction. The other kind we have is an endothermic reaction. Now, in an endothermic reaction, you have your reagents, but you need to add heat into that system in order to make it so that the reaction goes forward. So in an endothermic reaction, we could say that heat is one of our reagents, okay? That's just a summary of exothermic, endothermic. We'll get more into it later with the exact details. Before we move on, it's important to clarify what kind of units we're going to be using for our energy, thinking about thermodynamics and energy, and that's the joule. The joule is just the SI unit for energy. It equals, that should be a G over there, right there, yeah. So that's just kilograms times meters squared over seconds squared, or if a unit for, with the unit we're familiar with, 101.3 liter atmospheres. Okay, so you can also have kilojoules, so one kilojoule is just going to equal 1,000 kilojoules. You'll see that one often as well. Okay, so now then, we're going to jump right in and look at systems and surroundings, the energy of a system versus its surroundings, and how those two things interact with one another. Okay, so it's important first to define what is a system, what is its surroundings. So let's say we take this beaker here. In the beaker, the liquid components or the reagents inside the beaker are our system. So we can also write that these are the reagents. The surroundings are anything beyond that chemical system. So that could be your beaker, that could be the air, that could be a room. Basically anything that doesn't participate in the reaction but rather contains the reaction is the surroundings. And that's going to be important for us when we talk about the internal energy of a system. So the internal energy is just a sum of kinetic and potential energy of all mo molecules in the system. Now, when we talk about thermodynamic principles, it's difficult to quantify like an exact, exact amounts of things. So, for example, I couldn't just go take a chemical system and say, oh, it has X amount of energy. So what we usually do is we look at changes in thermodynamic systems to better quantify things. So as we know, in heat, can be heat and work are the two kinds of energy transfer. So the difference in internal energy between two systems is just the sum of heat released or absorbed as well as the work done on the system or by the system. Now, in this equation, we have Q and W, but the, s the signs of Q and W are going to be very important to look at. So let's look at, take a look at this little graphic here. So I'm just going to split this up, heat and work. So over here we have heat, over here is work. So for heat, if we have heat going into a system, as you'll see right here, that's going to be a positive Q. We're adding heat into a system. Conversely, if we're taking heat away from a system, that's going to be a negative Q, and that's going to be an endothermic kind of thing. If we're, add, if we're adding heat, it's going to be an exothermic kind of reaction. So let's take a look at this graphic in order to help us understand the sign conventions for our internal energy. So for heat on the left side here, we're going to use the fact that when we add heat when we add heat into a system it's going to be a positive delta Q, positive q when we take away heat from a system it's going to be negative q and that's pretty intuitive so for work on the right side work done onto a system so if we're adding if we're doing work onto a system it's almost like we're adding energy into that system so from a chemistry perspective, that's going to be a positive work. If the system does work on its surroundings, that's going to be a negative work because the system's kind of giving energy to its surroundings. So what will also be the case is that when we have an internal...